a lecturer in the Department of Communication Disorders here at the University of Canterbury and I'm also the Deputy Director at the Rose Centre for Stroke Recovery and Research. Um, that's a newly opened um, stroke research centre which I'll talk to you a little bit about further on in this talk. Um, so I'm going to talk for about 45 minutes-ish this evening and then um, allow a little bit of time for any questions that you might have. Uh, so um, any questions that you have I think I need to just restate the questions that everyone can hear it so I'll be repeating what every, everyone asks. So my topic is what if you couldn't eat your dinner tonight? My talk is on um, dysphagia. So dysphagia is the term we use to describe a swallowing impairment. Um, if we break the word down essentially it means a disorder of eating. We use this term clinically to describe, rather than a disorder of eating, um, a disorder of swallowing. So the difference between those two, eating involves the whole process of getting food into your mouth, swallowing it down into your stomach. Swallowing, we're really concerned with the mechanical process of once it's in your mouth, how does it get to your stomach? So the process involved in using your muscles, um, the nerves that control those muscles. So that's, that's the part of swallowing that we're interested in when we talk about dysphagia. Um, dysphagia can range from a very mild disorder, so just some slight pain when you're swallowing is considered a dysphagia, and it can range right up to a severe dysphagia where you're no longer t able to eat anything orally, so you can't take any of your nutrition and hydration through your mouth, and instead you're reliant on a tube through the stomach or a tube through the nose that goes down to the stomach to provide you with all of your nutrition and hydration. So a big range of um, problems that you can have under the term dysphagia. <clears throat> to understand impaired swallowing, you need to know a little bit about normal swallowing. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that now and give you um, a, a very brief summary about what um, healthy swallowing looks like. So this is an animation of swallowing and it is a very, very much a simplified version of what actually happens in our mouth and our throat when we swallow. But even the simplified version is complex enough because it's such a complex task that we do. Um, so I'll talk you through a little bit of the anatomy here so you know what you're looking at. So this is like you're looking at me in this direction and I've sliced off half of my face this way and you can see what's happening in my mouth and my throat. So here we have the mouth and here we have the throat. Now the throat is the space that we share for quite a few functions as humans, okay? So when we're breathing, we breathe through our mouth or our nose and air goes past our, and through our throat and into our lungs. It's also the space that we use to send food back into um, when we're swallowing, drinking, and um, I'll show you where those different parts go. Okay, so it's the shared space for breathing, speaking, and eating. This wide open space here that's highlighted in red is the entrance to the lungs. Okay, and the reason that sits nice and open wide while we're just sitting here at rest is because that's what we want to be doing. And we want it to, we want it to be nice and easy to breathe while we're just sitting there. It's a pretty important function, funnily enough. So when we're sitting there, we have a nice wide open airway so that air can freely go in and out and keep us alive. This tiny little passageway down the back here that heads down towards the back of the throat is the entrance to the esophagus. Okay, so this actually sits closed when we're sitting there at rest. Obviously, we don't want to be breathing air down into our stomach. We also don't want stomach contents coming up into our throat. So we have a little sphincter muscle that sits at the top of the esophagus and that stays closed when we're at rest. Okay, so you can see from this diagram that a lot of change has to happen in this anatomy to accommodate, to change it from breathing anatomy to accommodate a big mouthful of sandwich, for example. So if I chew up a mouthful of sandwich, throw it back into my throat, you can see here a lot has to change for that to go down to the stomach rather than head down to the entrance into the lungs. And so the way that we achieve that is this little bone in the throat here called the hyoid bone, it moves forward. <clears throat> and when you feel if you swallow, you can feel your Adam's apple move forward and up. There's a little bone that helps to move that forward and up. Okay, and what that does, this little protective flap that sits above the airway when your Adam's apple moves up and forward, it flips that little flap over top of the airway. So it closes it off, stopping that big ball of sandwich going straight down into your lungs. The other thing it does is um, it pulls on that little sphincter muscle that holds the esophagus closed. So when it moves forward, it tugs on it and it helps to open it up. And what that does is it then makes the space for the big ball of sandwich to head straight down towards 
the esophagus down towards the stomach. Okay, so they're the changes that take place to make our anatomy safe and effective for breathing and swallowing. Okay? The anatomy is set up that we are primarily set up to breathe and if we swallow and things aren't coordinated correctly you can see how things might go wrong and I'll show you a little bit about that in a wee while. So if you watch this animation you send food down back into the throat, airway closes and you have the esophagus opening up. Okay. We break swallowing up into a few different phases when we're talking about it, and these are really just conceptual phases so that we can get our head around this um, complex act. So the first phase is the oral phase. <clears throat> this is the phase where if you're chewing something, you're moving your mouth up and down, you're moving it around in your mouth in between your teeth. It's the part of swallowing that you have control over. You can volitionally control the oral phase as much as you like. You can chew as many times as you want. You can chew as long as you want to. You can sit there and chew a mouthful for half an hour if you like. It's completely up to you. You can stop midway through a chew and carry on talking. All of that is under your control. As soon as you send whatever it is that you're eating back into your throat, this is where the pharyngeal phase kicks in. And the pharynx is just another fancy word for throat. So this is, this is the phase of swallowing that happens once you send the food into your throat. Once it's back there, you have very little control over it. If I asked you to send a big mouthful of sandwich back into your throat and then said, stop the swallow, it's not going to happen. Your body needs to protect the airway, needs to get it down past the airway and out of the way so your body just takes over and it's more of a reflex at that point. So there are lots of different components of swallowing, okay? Very volitional components and more reflexive components. So the two phases are broadly distinguished between the different levels of control we have, but as I said, they're really just convenience for us to wrap our head around the complex act. Swallowing is very much a single pressure-driven event, and so I'm going to get you to do an activity just to highlight what I mean by that. So I want you to try, open your mouth and try and swallow with your mouth open. Don't worry, everyone looks silly when they do this. <laughs> what do you notice? What does your tongue try to do? Goes up to the roof of your mouth. So what it's trying to do is it's trying to compensate for the fact that you haven't closed your lips and it's trying to seal off the front of your mouth. Okay? So now what I want you to do is try swallowing with your mouth wide open and poke your tongue out a little bit so it can't touch the roof of your mouth. Feel your Adam's apple and feel what happens. Can you get your swallow going? It's moving up and down but it's probably not because of a swallow, right? So you can see here that the lips are at the very front of the system. They are involved in the oral phase. They're very volitional. You can control everything you do about them. But you can see that you change something as simple as the lip closure, and you can't get anything happening here in the reflexive stage. So it's all very much interrelated and tied in with, with every other part of swallowing. It's a very precise and coordinated event that we do. Who would know? I mean, you've probably something you've never thought about before and now you won't stop thinking about for the next few days. So swallowing is one of the most complex things that we do as humans. Uh, it involves around 55 pairs of muscles um, and they, they contract in a very precise order. Um, these muscles are controlled by about five cranial nerves and the nerves are told what to do by lots and lots of areas of the brain. So adding to this complexity, I want you to wait until you next have a mouthful of a little bit of saliva, swallow it down and tell me how long you think it takes from start to finish. What are we thinking? About two seconds? Takes just less than one second. So if you think about 55 pairs of muscles, all of those brain activations, all happening in a very precise, coordinated fashion, all happening in less than one second, it's pretty amazing that we do that so often. Okay? and most of the time without even thinking about it. So how do we achieve such a complex behaviour? So when we are little and for the first few months of our life, reflexes. We have a sucking reflex, we have a rooting reflex, all of these things help us to attach to a teat of a bottle, a nipple, anything like that, and gain nutrition. Okay, and that's how we manage to swallow for the first few months of life. We also have anatomy that is different to what we have as adults. We more closely reflect monkeys in our anatomy when we are babies um, rather than adult humans. And so what I mean by this is here's a 
he's an infant here. Um, you've got an adult in the middle and a monkey on the right. So the, the relationship between the different swallowing structures are more closely aligned to a monkey's structures, and I'll tell you why that is. I couldn't find a picture to demonstrate this, so this is some of my own fancy artwork. I'm going to have to explain this through to you because it just looks like a whole bunch of squiggles. But this here is a baby's anatomy, and this here is an adult's anatomy. So here we have the lips, lips here in the adult, hard palate, tongue, hard palate, tongue. This structure here is the little punching bag that you see if you have a wide open throat and you're looking down the back of someone's throat. Okay? This structure here is that little protective flap that I showed you on the previous one that folds over the airway to close the airway off. So what you'll notice here is that in babies, the gap between these two structures is much smaller, and in, sometimes they, in, in, in some cases they actually touch. <clears throat> Whereas in adults, we have this wide space between these two structures. So what that means is that as adults here, we have a nice wide open space from our mouth right back through to our throat. Okay, so breathing is pretty easy through our mouth. For babies, we essentially have the mouth is sealed off from the throat. And this is why babies are obligate nasal breathers. They don't naturally breathe through their mouth because essentially it's very hard to breathe through these structures that are in the way of, of that airflow. And there's a good reason why babies are set up with their oral cavities or their mouths kind of separated from the throat. It allows them to do things in the mouth without needing to stop breathing, okay? So because they can't control what happens with their swallowing so much, it lets them suckle, gain milk in their mouth without having to stop breathing, and then when they need to transfer milk back into their throat, they stop breathing at that point to swallow. So it just lets them be a bit more efficient and keep breathing up for a longer period of time than if they had to stop breathing for that whole process. So it allows babies to suck and breathe at the same time. There's a common misconception that babies can breathe and swallow at the same time. Actually, there's a common misconception that adult humans are the only mammals that can't do it. But you'll find that any mammal, babies, adults, any type of mammal, is unable to swallow and breathe at the same time. And I'll talk about why in a minute. The other thing that is different between a baby and an adult's anatomy is that um, the larynx, which is just your airway, it's your Adam's apple, it sits tucked up under the tongue as opposed to adults, it descends down after the first four years of life, it starts to move down further in the neck and that allows us to speak and communicate. Um, but as a baby, the primary um, target is to just keep the airway safe, so it's tucked in under the, under the tongue where things can't fall into it, you can't get food and fluid in there so easily. Okay, so why we can't breathe and swallow at the same time. Here's the same cross-section of the, of the anatomy. If you're breathing through your nose, you have air coming through the nasal passage, down through the throat or that shared um, space, down into the lungs. When you swallow, you eat food from the mouth, goes through that shared passage again and down the back here. So the fact that there's crossover of these two systems is why you can never have those two things occurring together. You can have things occurring just in the mouth while you maintain breathing through the nose and into the airway. So that's why we are able to chew and keep breathing. That's why these, and this is a, an important um, survival mechanism for lots of mammals. This uh, leopard is carrying its dinner up into a tree where it's going to stay safe. It can't hold its breath for the whole time that it's carrying that. So its mouth is separate to the passage that it's using for breathing. In the same way, this little deer has to smell for predators the whole time it's chewing. So it can chew and breathe at the same time, but as soon as it swallows, you'll notice that they pop their head up because they can't breathe at the same time as swallowing. So they look around for predators at that point. What happens beyond our reflexes? When our reflexes diminish after the first four or five months of life, we start to get more mature structures. So our tongue movement develops, we get teeth, all the muscles that we use for chewing start to develop as well as our brains start to become more mature. So we can handle the, the requirements of more, um, more adult swallowing, if you like. So it's a pretty amazing neurological system that we have that can control all of these things, all of this complex um, procession of events all at once. 
studies that have looked at what parts of the brain are involved in swallowing show that essentially it just lights up like a Christmas tree. Our whole brain gets involved somewhere along the process of swallowing. It's also a pretty complex neurological system. Some of you will know that if I, for limb movement, so for hand and leg movement, if I move my right arm, it's the left side of my brain that is telling my right arm what to do. So we have that in the head and neck muscles, we have that crossover. We also have the same side of the brain telling the same side of those muscles what to do. So in summary, both sides of our brain tell both sides of our swallowing muscles what to do. And there's a good reason for this. It's kind of a redundancy, if you like. And if you think about the functions that we do in the head and neck, we breathe, we cough, we swallow, and we communicate. And so what this means is that if you have a lesion or injury to one side of your brain, you're still going to get um, commands from the other side of the brain going to both sides of your head and neck muscles. So it just allows a little bit more room um, for error. It means that we're not going to end up with impairment as easily as we would in our limbs. So as I said before, we're, the design of our anatomy is primarily designed for us to breathe because we need that to constantly survive. So here are a couple of different um, views just to show you how our anatomy predisposes us to um, getting food and fluid into our lungs if our neurological system isn't efficient at controlling everything. So here's that same picture. You've got your shared space here of the throat the tiny little tube down towards the back where food needs to go and the wide open space where we breathe. This view is, pretend that you shrunk yourself down to about this size. You jumped on my tongue and you walked down the back and you looked over the base of my tongue. That's what you'd see. So here you've got this wide open space, um, which is gravity is, is predisposing things to just fall right in there, is the entrance to our lungs. And this tiny little space at the back that stays closed is the entrance to the esophagus. So you can see that there needs to be a lot of efficient movement to make sure that everything happens effectively and safely. <clears throat> so let's look at normal swallowing and what it looks like in real time. This image, it's actually a video, I'm going to play you a video here, but this is what we use as the gold standard for assessing uh, swallowing disorders. It allows us to see most of the anatomy um, and it allows us to, what we do is we put some contrast in whatever the person is about to eat. And so it shows up that if the fluid or food looks black on the x-ray, you'll see what that looks like. So what that allows us to do is track where it goes really nicely. It's very clear when they're swallowing something where it's going. We can see whether it goes down towards the stomach or whether it goes down towards the lungs. So I'll just orient you first here. Here's the person's mouth. Um, here's the person's spine. Ignore these things here. Um, they're just things that we place on the... Um, participant for research. Here you have that little bone in the throat and here is the protective flap that goes over the airway. This wide open space here is the entrance to the lungs. You'll see the little point here which is where the sphincter muscle at the top of the esophagus sits. Underneath the entrance to the lungs you'll see this kind of wide open column and that's the windpipe. So if we look at what normal swallowing looks like, if you blink you miss it. Right, it happens so fast. So I've slowed it down a little bit, but I'll play that again. This person's swallowing liquid, so it doesn't need any preparation. So you can see all of the airway goes up here and protects itself and everything goes down the back here towards the stomach. Here's another video of somebody chewing something up and, and swallowing it down. Again, very quick. You blink, you miss it. So you can see here's the airway. I'll play that once more. Here's the airway wide open while they're chewing. As soon as they send it back, this airway tucks up underneath the tongue and it all heads down towards the stomach. So why do we care about swallowing disorders? What impact does it have on people and why are we driven to research them? Over the next couple of slides, I want you to just think about how often you swallow. Just swallow as often as you need to for your saliva, but just try and think about how often you do it. Um, the first reason we care is that we depend on it for nutrition and hydration. You don't need to have a severe dysphagia or a severe swallowing problem to end up with malnutrition or dehydration. If you have a problem with some textures, 99% of people just avoid those textures. Okay, So if you have problems with fluids, 
you stop drinking so much because it makes you cough all the time. You end up dehydrated, you end up malnourished because you're avoiding certain things. Um, if eating is just a pain, it takes you an hour and a half to finish a meal, you're not going to sit there for the hour and a half. You're going to stay there for your normal amount of time and you're just going to eat much less. Okay, so if you think about the complications of malnutrition and dehydration, especially in populations like um, premature babies or um, elderly sick people, then the complications of swallowing impairment become quite apparent. We also care because without it we miss out on a lot of fun. Okay, so just about everything that we do revolves around eating and or drinking. So birthdays, Christmas, weddings, um, just dinner with the family at night, drinks after work with friends, everything tends to revolve around eating and drinking. And so if you are choking on every mouthful that you take or you have to feed yourself through a fluid put down into your stomach um, tube, it's just something that you avoid doing. So the biggest thing we hear from patients is that it's very socially isolating. Um, quality of life goes down substantially when you can't eat, um, when you, or even when you can eat and it's just a bit of a problem. Um, we also care because if we don't swallow well, it has very serious health consequences. If you swallow things and it goes down the wrong pipe, um, it can lead to an aspiration pneumonia. It's what we call a, a chest infection, um, and everybody's heard of that. If, especially if you are someone, say you've had a stroke, you're lying in a hospital bed, so you're not moving around, you're not exercising much, and you are constantly getting things down into your lungs, and you develop a chest infection. Um, it's one of the major causes of people having a bounce back admission to hospital. What that means is if you are discharged from hospital and then you are readmitted within a month, a big reason that you'll be readmitted is because you've developed a chest infection. The biggest price is paid by patients because it's um, one of the fourth leading causes of death in the elderly is a, an infection due to food and fluid going down into the lungs. So how often do you think you swallowed over the last couple of slides? A few times? We do it a lot. If you've got a problem with swallowing, it's pretty hard to ignore. Um, you swallow about once every one or two minutes without even thinking about it. When you're asleep, about once every 12 minutes. But uh, There's been some research in the lab looking at sleep swallowing and some people don't swallow and they swallow about once every hour. It's pretty boring research to do. <laughs> um, yeah, so if you have a problem with swallowing, it's something that you are, you are constantly facing all day, every day. So let's talk a little bit about disordered swallowing. It occurs across the lifespan. We have um, in children lots of different syndromes can cause swallowing disorders. Uh, structural problems like cleft palate, um, cleft lip and palate. In adolescence the main cause of um, swallowing disorders is head injury. So from things like motor vehicle accidents or sports accidents. Um, so damage to the parts of the brain that control swallowing. In adults, we have neurological conditions like Parkinson's disease, motor neuron disease, but again, we have the structural problems like head and neck cancer. If you have the base of your tongue removed for a tumour, you're going to have problems with getting food down into your throat and swallowing effectively. The leading cause of swallowing impairment in adults is stroke. So I thought I'd just talk a little bit about stroke and how it's um, related to swallowing impairment. We have a high incidence of um, stroke in New Zealand compared to other developed countries. We have about 9,000 stroke events per year and about 2,500 2, deaths a result of these um, 9,000 strokes. In Canterbury alone we have about 1,100 Canterburians admitted with a stroke each year. At any given year we have 32,000 survivors um, that require supportive care due to a stroke. And the cost of a single admission in the Canterbury District, District Health Board for an uncomplicated stroke is around $13,000. Okay? So how does this relate to swallowing? Swallowing is a big problem for people who have a stroke. About 60% of these patients will have some problem with swallowing after their stroke. And approximately 30% of these people will develop a chest infection because of their swallowing disorder. The reason that is so important in terms of figures and, and health and all of that kind of thing, is that um, if you have a pneumonia, it increases the cost of your admission by anywhere between ten and $23,000. Okay? 
Okay? So if you think about the fact that we have 1,100 Cantabrians going in for stroke, if you do the math and work out the percentage of people that are likely to, one, have a swallowing impairment and two, develop a chest infection, each year um, the chest infection side of things costs Canterbury District Health Board about $3 million. So it's a big problem. So how do you know if someone has a swallowing impairment? A big one is coughing and choking every time you drink or eat something. The feeling that food hasn't quite gotten out of your throat, you've swallowed and it's still there, you keep swallowing, it just feels like it's stuck. Things coming out of your nose is a big sign that something's not going right. Everybody's had the occasional <laughs> occurrence where that's happened, that's not necessarily a big deal, it just means that you weren't coordinating things for that specific moment. An inability to chew up food or food staying in the mouth after you've swallowed. Weight loss. Um, if you, one, are avoiding foods, you tend to lose weight. Two, if things aren't making its way down to your esophagus, they're going somewhere else, then you tend to end up losing weight because you're not getting your nutrition. Dribbling, changes in voice or speech. So when you talk, if you notice you talk afterwards and your voice sounds different, it's probably because there's a bunch of stuff still left in your throat that changes what your voice sounds like. And another big indicator is that you're constantly getting chest infections. So aspiration is the term we use to describe things going down the wrong pipe. Okay? It just is the term we use to say there's entry of food or fluid and it's gone down past the level of your vocal folds into your windpipe. Approximately 50% of people who have a swallowing problem end up with food or fluid going down the wrong way. Aspiration itself is not a big deal. We all aspirate our saliva quite frequently. But if we're healthy, our lungs can clear that and saliva isn't really a big deal. If you are aspirating everything you eat, if you're aspirating Coke, McDonald's, wine, beer, those things the lungs can't handle so well. And if you're aspirating a lot of that kind of stuff, the lungs definitely can't handle that. So that's when we start to run into problems with things like infection. How do we stop aspiration? Healthy people cough. Okay, we've all had that instance where something's gone down the wrong pipe and you have an uncontrollable coughing fit. That is a good thing. That is your body's way of protecting the lungs. Never ever try and stifle your cough. If you're coughing, get it up, get it out. That's your body protecting itself. About 40% of patients who have a swallowing impairment don't have a cough reflex. They, their bodies don't register that something has gone down the wrong pipe. Okay, so the problem with this is if you go in as a speech therapist and you go in to see a patient after they've had a stroke and they're sitting in their bed and you say, here, I want to see how you're going with your swallowing, how are things going? Yes, everything's going fine. You hand them a big glass of water, chug it back, look absolutely fine, no problems. If they are one of these people who aspirate and they don't cough, things could be going right down into their windpipe and you have no idea from looking at them from the outside. They're their sensation is decreased, their sensation is impaired after their stroke, so they don't have the sensory receptors to tell the body to cough. This is a big problem. How do we tell these patients apart from those patients that are actually doing fine with their swallowing? You can't tell from looking at the outside because they both look the same. We go back to this video x-ray that I showed you before. It's the only way that we can see whereabouts the food or fluid is going, whether it's going into the airway or into the esophagus. So I'm going to show you this one, and this is an example of somebody who has a swallowing impairment. Again, I'll just orient you here. Here's the mouth. This wide open space back here is the throat. You've got the spine of the person. Here's the little bone that moves forward. Here's the wee protective flap. This space here is the entrance to the lungs, and you'll see here that this is where the esophagus should open up to let the food and fluid through. The first thing you'll notice is it's not speedy and efficient like the first one that we've seen. And you can see here you've got this big line of black going straight down into the airway and I think this is slowed down. So watch here, this is the entrance to the lungs, here are the vocal folds, straight down here. You've got a tiny bit happening going down where it should be going, but a very small amount. Most of that's heading down the wrong way. And I can tell from watching this video, that patient hasn't coughed either. When you see a cough, the whole body kind of goes and things start to move. So no, no, um, 
re reaction of the body to say, get that out of the airway. So what do we do about these patients? Um, swallowing treatment is a relatively new field of research. It's only really in the last 30 years that swallowing rehab has even been a thing. So treatment techniques have developed ahead of the evidence for them. So swallowing research is kind of working backwards to provide evidence for treatments that are already commonly used because the urgency was to treat patients. We needed something to treat these patients who were presenting with disorders. So there was no time to wait for research. It's all kind of putting the um, cart before the horse. So swallowing rehab typically involves two things. The first one is restoring people back to their normal way of swallowing, fixing it. Okay, so if we think about it as an, an analogy of someone breaking their leg, okay, you get the bone reset, you put them in a cast, they heal, they go back to being able to walk on that leg like they did before, more or less. The other way is through compensation. And I liken this to using a crutch. Okay, it's like walking into your doctor, broken leg, they hand you two crutches and say, there you go, you can keep on walking. You're not going to be able to use that leg again, but just keep walking using the crutches. We're going to talk about that one first because unfortunately that's um, typically how swallowing impairment is managed. Um, and it's basically because it provides the most immediate results. It's pretty easy to do. You change the, what somebody's eating, you thicken their liquids, you puree their foods, you tell them to put their chin like this every time they swallow, dysphagia fixed. The problem with this is that it requires the person to execute whatever it is that they're doing for every single swallow. Okay, so the biggest thing that comes from this is patients stop complying with these instructions. And it's no wonder, okay, if you are having to do this for the rest of all time on every single swallow that you do, it becomes a pretty, a pretty horrible task to have to endure. If you think about, I mentioned before, that one way of compensating for dysphagia is pureeing food. So imagine this is your steak and veggie for the night. If you have dysphagia, this is your steak and veggie for the night. Chicken and veg to chicken and veg. And as appetizing as these all options, as these options all look, I'm sure you'll agree that fixing the swallowing impairment, so going to the root of the cause and fixing that is the optimal approach when you look at the two. So let's talk about how we can restore people back to their normal swallowing function. The problem is here that we have no unequivocal evidence for any rehab strategy in swallowing um, rehab. It all sounds a bit horrible and daunting, doesn't it? But we're getting there, okay? And that's where I'm going to introduce to you the um, Rose Centre for Stroke Recovery and Research. Um, just a little bit about how we came to be. Um, Mrs Shirley Rose uh, was the reason that we were able to start the centre. Um, she spent the uh, final years of her husband's life caring for him after he suffered a very debilitating stroke. So she left a $450,000 bequest to start a new centre, which is what we named the Rose Centre in her memory. It's <clears throat> made up of uh, the bequest that Mrs Rose left and also a um, combination of the University of Canterbury, the College of Science and the Canterbury Medical Research Foundation. So in November of last year, we moved to uh, custom-built premises in St George's Medical Centre, um, and in April of this year, we had our official opening. In May, we hosted an international stroke conference where we gathered a whole lot of international researchers, clinicians, all who work in the area of stroke rehab. So lots of different disciplines. We had physiotherapists, speech therapists, um, biomedical engineers, um, all coming to talk to about the different technologies and new technologies that are starting to emerge and that are proving really useful in stroke rehab. So what goes on at the Rose Centre? It's a pretty busy place. Um, it's home to 10 postgraduate students, all of who are students at the University of Canterbury, so they're either doing masters or PhD research. Um, they are primarily supervised by the director, who is Maggie Lee Huckabee. It also houses the EATS clinic, and I'll talk to you about that in a slide coming up. Um, this clinic provides diagnostic and treatment um, centres for people with swallowing disorders. So anyone and everyone with swallowing disorders, we see we can do diagnosis right through to intensive treatment. It also houses some of the state-of-the-art instrumentation and technology that facilitates all of the above. So all of the student research and all of the um, clinical approaches that we take, uh, we have a lot of instrumentation. I'll show you some of that in a minute. 
So I thought I'll just give you a taste of some of the research that's happening at the centre with 10 postgraduate students. I didn't think I'd have you all here till midnight telling you about all the research that goes on, but this stuff is uh, kind of clinically relevant and given I've talked to you quite a bit about pneumonia, I thought this might be a nice um, study to tell you about. So the study is being um, completed by Sarah Davies and she is a PhD student at the university. Um, her supervisor is Maggie Lee and she's got another two supervisors, John, Dr John Fink and Dr Jeffrey Tompkins. They're looking at cough reflex testing. So I mentioned that a lot of stroke patients, um, after their stroke, they don't have a cough reflex. What this test does is it uses this little mask, a nebulizer mask, and it um, mists citric acid. Okay, so citric acid is a pretty benign thing, but if you inhale it, it's going to make you cough. It irritates your airways and really sends you into a coughing fit. If you are a healthy person, if you have an airway that detects irritation. So what they did is they uh, have given it to every person who comes through the Canterbury District Health Board with a stroke, and they do this before they test them with food or fluid. Okay, so you nebulise. If someone has a really good strong cough, yes, the airway is detecting that things are going down the wrong way or when they're irritated. We then proceed to giving them food or fluid, okay, and then see how they go with that. If somebody doesn't cough when you nebulise citric acid into them, they are the ones that raise the red flags, and we say, hold on a minute, we don't want to give these people food or fluid at bedside because they're probably going to look like they're doing really well, but it might be going down the wrong way and sending it straight down to their lungs. So then we send those patients off to get a video x-ray done where we can see where things are going. So the Sarah's coming towards the end of her PhD and she's got some great results. Um, with doing this protocol for all stroke patients, they've reduced pneumonia rates in the uh, Christchurch hospital from 27% to about 11%. And so when you think about the fact that a pneumonia adds about ten dollars to $23,000 per um, hospitalisation, it's saved about $1.5 million for the time in which it's been implemented. <laughs> so it's really um, great research for, for clinical applicability. So the EATS Clinic stands for Evaluation and Treatment of Swallowing. We love acronyms at the Rose Centre. You'll find them on everything. Everything is acronymed. Um, these started before we actually had the Rose Centre and they became um, a possibility through a significant donation of $250,000 from a very generous Cantabrian who uh, wishes to remain anonymous. So they were formally opened in 2013 and they provide comprehensive specialty services for rehab of swallowing. They're able to provide a unique service in that we can see we're not restricted by the resource problems that you have in a district health board. Um, if you have a swallowing problem and you have, you're able to walk again after your stroke, you're able to do most things but you still have a problem with swallowing, you're generally sent home and you're seen by a speech therapist in the community. These speech therapists have huge caseloads um, and there's only so much that they can see you for. The, the availability to do intensive rehab is not there once you're sent home. So our clinics allow us to challenge best practice, if you like. It allows us to see patients as intensively as we need to. Um, we see patients often twice per day, every day, for uh, two to three weeks. We also have, um, because we have all the research going on in the same centre, any things that we find, we can translate that, the clinical protocol, we, we can translate a research protocol into a clinical protocol pretty much immediately, which um, is a nice, a nice thing to have. So this is the team at the centre, minus a few newbies who have come since the photo was taken. But you can see here that this is, um, this machine here, which Dr Huckabee's sitting in front of, is our own video x-ray machine. So I think we are one of two swallowing labs in the world that has our own um, video x-ray, which is a really great thing to have when you need to do diagnostic work very fast. Um, we have lots of different instrumentation. The other thing we have in this picture are the two biomedical engineers who are part of our team. These people, I didn't even know what biomedical engineering was before I started my studies, and these people are just invaluable to anything. They can apply their skills and make everyone's life easier, basically. They apply technologies and, and can make things, um, you know, you think up an idea and you think, wouldn't this be great? Biomedical engineers can make it happen. So we love our biomedical engineers. So I thought I'd finish off by talking to you about Eric, who is a patient who we've seen through the Rose Centre, and he is, um, you can actually find a video of him on our website as well. He's um, someone who loves talking about the Rose Centre and his experience. 
So Eric um, was a firefighter for Urban Search and Rescue. Um, he uh, was one of the first responders in the Pike River mine disaster and also the Christchurch earthquakes. Um, he was also a building, a building thespian and a singer in the community theatre and it was, he was engaged to his fiancée, Tia, at this, at this stage. In 2013, he suffered a series of strokes. Um, he was 33 at the time and these left him very, uh, very debilitated. Um, it was a very rare blood disorder that caused his strokes. So he had a prolonged hospitalisation at Christchurch Hospital. <coughs> he then had his rehabilitation at Burwood Hospital and he was discharged home after quite a lengthy stay. Um, he was unable to eat. He received his nutrition through a tube in his stomach and he still had significant physical disability. So just to mention here that um, not all strokes happen to elderly people. 25% of all first strokes happen to people under the age of 65, and, and that's quite young. Um, only 50% of these people are able to return to work within six months. So often you have strokes that are debilitating enough that people are off work for a significant amount of time. They can't return to their normal lives. The thing with younger patients is that um, if they survive their stroke, their time of living with an impairment is much longer. Okay, he's 30, Eric's 33, and you can imagine that um, the impact that this has had on his life, um, financially, socially, mentally, the whole thing. It's a, it's a huge change of life, just suddenly like that one day. And so he's 33, he's got his whole life ahead of him, and this is what he's dealing with. Rehab surfaces, surfaces are not um, fantastic when you're a younger person either unless you have it due to an accident. If you're covered by ACC, things are pretty good. Um, if you are sick because of illness, it tends to be, your, your services are, are much more restricted. So just um, to finish on a happy note, the outcomes for Eric. Eric uh, returned to a full diet of eating whatever he wants. In his video on the Rose Centre, he talks about how he now can eat double down burgers from KFC, something he only dreamed of when he first had his stroke. Um, he's returned to an active social life. He can go for a beer with his mates, which he said was such a big thing to not be able to do. Um, he's considering a return to university for a second career. He's no longer able to serve as a firefighter in USAR team um, because of his physical disabilities. Uh, and he is um, being seen at the Rose Centre now for some um, speech rehab. His speech is still quite slurry. Um, he's much uh, easier to understand than right after strokes, but it still, is still a work in progress. And he still walks with a cane, he still has persisting motor difficulties. So on that note, in terms of what we want to achieve at the Rose Centre over the next five years, last year and this year was focused on really kind of beefing up what we do best, which is swallowing research. Um, establishing the Rose Centre um, and expanding the EATS clinic so that we can provide that service really well. What we want to do from next year onwards is start to include multidisciplinary uh, avenues for stroke rehab so that people like Eric have one place that they can go and get everything that they need. So we're looking at getting cognitive communication services, uh, nutrition <coughs> services like dietitians involved, nursing, physiotherapy and occupational therapy. We love visitors at the centre so if you would like to take a tour of the centre, if you want to be a research participant, if you know someone with a swallowing disorder, if you have a swallowing disorder yourself, we love to hear from people, so please do get in contact if there's any reason that you, that you need to contact the Rose Centre. And that's, that's me. 45 minutes on the dot, that was pretty good. <laughs>